Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Architects Tomorrow. I am really, really pleased that I've managed to secure another all-female panel. It's fantastic. I, I really appreciate the uh, time uh, that the ladies who join us on the channel give. It's really brilliant to see the different sort of faces and perspectives of, of different architects and different trans technology transformation peoples. Usual disclaimer, Architect Tomorrow is a frank personal exchange of views. It's not necessarily the views of a current, any current or former employer and that allows us to sort of have a an open and free conversation but by no means does this necessarily re reflect any official views from anywhere um and with that out of the way um so wendy uh lisa thank you so much for coming back um and it's great to have Catherine join us as well and we'll, we'll get on sort of intros shortly um so wendy i was sort of reflecting uh, I think the last time you were on was possibly reflecting on 2021 and predicting what 2022 had in store. So thank you for joining us for that one. What's exciting for me is I've been trying to get you on to talk about the book for some time. And it's amazing that the stars have aligned and we managed to find a window in diaries to make this happen. Uh, and also have a couple of other people who've been reading the book have a chat with you about it. So that's fantastic. I'd also like to touch on the women in architecture movement. So with that sort of out of the way, Wendy, uh, I'm conscious that I just call you Wendy, but actually, is everyone pronouncing your name wrong? What's the Norwegian way of saying your name? Oh, that's such a good question, because it's sort of in the eye of the beholder, right? So it is officially Wendy, like the Peter Pan Wendy, right? So spelled with a bunch of crazy words. But that's fascinating that you asked because um, in Norway or Sweden, they call me Vinda. Um, or if I'm in Brazil, people might say Wenji. So I've sort of, I like it to be adapted to wherever I am. It's contextual. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. So it, did you say Vin Vinda for Vinda. Norway? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I kind of like to call people by their proper proper names. So maybe I'll try and try and do that. Maybe we'll, <laughs> and we also both appear on consultant saying things. So perhaps on the next episode. I might, I, might, I might call you that and see if it gets Phil and uh, Chris really confused. Um, but Wendy, perhaps, I know you've appeared a couple of times, but I don't think we've really touched on your sort of your brief career stories. Um, it was a very unintentional career journey. So I'm a science person by training and I think nature, biology, chemistry, sustainability, that's all my education. But um, I've just found myself in business and sort of have fallen in love with the design of organizations and really thinking about them as organisms. So have been working in this field long, long time. Um, business architecture is my big passion. And, you know, where I find myself today is I wake up every day and serve a global vision and a global community around this idea of how do we do better end-to-end -end strategy execution and underpin that with business architecture and leverage business architecture for other things. So, you know, my world from a education or community building or whatever perspective, it really orbits around all of that. Awesome. So, um, Lisa, thanks again for coming back. Um, uh, I know you're currently a large media company, but when we met, you were at uh, Ordnance Survey, weren't you? But can you give the listeners a sense of your kind of career journey into technology transformation? And also, I think you should definitely touch on your blogging because that's how we met. I don't want to go back too far in my career history because I'll take up the whole of the show, Oliver, because it just goes on for far too long. But I guess if I focus on the world of business architecture, I sort of fell into it probably 20 years ago when it didn't even have hadn't really even been defined. I think it's a term that's been more defined as we've gone through the last probably 10 years. Um, I just saw myself as somebody who was really interested in business and how IT could help the business change and then how um, operating models with offshoring and outsourcing was changing the operating model of an insurance company that I was in. So from that angle of looking at IT from a business lens, and then going on a journey of outsourcing and changing the operating model of an insurance company, I sort of fell into business architecture. Um, and the insurance company that I was working for at the time really got it. They wouldn't have described it as business architecture, but they got the change agenda, the ability to work with HR, with finance and with IT and going on that operational journey. Um, and then from then, it's just gone full throttle really across architecture in general it architecture solution architecture business architecture enterprise architecture which there's a whole 
load of debates that go on when you discuss all of the different domains but essentially I'm going to say it business architecture is the best role to be in it's the more holistic it covers all the areas um and Wendy's book you know I've read it over the last couple of weeks and every page was sort of telling the journey I've been on but I hadn't realized I'd been on that journey you know it, it's it's there laid out and it's the journey I've been on. Catherine welcome uh, I think you are the 15th lady to join Architect tomorrow as a guest, as a female guest. So welcome. Um, thank you for sort of, you know, a- a- adding yourself to the, the community and the conversation. Um, your um, career is also pretty fascinating, right? And I know um, when we've spoken, you've talked about being a COO at an agritech sort of startup. If you can give us a sense of what came before that and how you sort of have landed in the sort of delivery principal role that you're now in? I'll, I'll start right back at the very beginning. So uh, my, my dad, you know, we, we all put our dad on our pedestals. He um, He's a management consultant, so he's worked with multi-million pound businesses. He's worked with small businesses, his own startup type businesses. So, so business conversation is something that we have always just done, he and I. So I've, I've learned a lot by osmosis without necessarily realising it. Um, so I did, did the whole university thing, similar to, to Wendy with the science background, um, randomly ended up in the world of IT consultancy, um, didn't necessarily have passion for it, just sort of found myself there, got on a really good graduate program. Um, I moved on from there and worked as an independent IT consultant. So I ran my own company. I mean, I say ran my own company. It was a, a one man band thing. So as far as business running goes, it wasn't really that. Um, I have run my own business um, and, and I think just through through the doing, I've done a lot of learning um, I've I've sort of progressed through utilities industries, through media, through um, maps as well, ordnance survey. Um, I've worked in various different roles as project managers or delivery managers, business analysis. Um, I like the variety. I like the spectrum. Um, you get to see more when you do different roles, you get to understand how different elements of a business work. And then I think the thing for me where I was able to pull it all together was, as you say, Ollie, the the chief operating officer at uh, an agritech startup. And that was just great. Um, And I found myself doing for me what seemed sensible and logical and where I didn't know how to do something, I'd read up on it, see what other people were doing. And and it's only when reading this book, I've realized what I was doing was business architecture, um, but being absolutely clueless to, to that's what I was actually doing. So I was coming up with some of these ideas and, and thinking, oh, that would be a good way to address this. And if you split it into different sections and, and reading this book, I sort of had one of those Meg Ryan moments. The, yes, yes, yes. It was sort of every page. It was like, yes. So it's been it's been lovely reading the book and, and just sort of thinking I'm, I'm totally on board with this. Love it. Awesome. No, thank you. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, I think we all have a shared passion for the book. Um, so with that, let's let's move on to the book. So I'm going to do the the classic thing. So on our set tomorrow, for those of you who are new to the to the series, uh, I do an unboxing series. Of, 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 of generally, it's books with, with with book authors in the architecture sort of space. And so yeah, here we are. So I've got I've got the book here. Uh, let me just sort of get rid of some of the some of the packaging. Let's just sort of throw, throw that out of the way. Uh, there you go. So yes, strategy to reality by um, Wendy Keane, as, as 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 most people in the sort of English speaking world uh, <laughs> maybe you call her. Um, but Wendy, look, fantastic, and thanks, um, thank, thanks again for for you know for a sharing the book with us in the first place, but b coming to talk talk to us about it. And I guess where I'd like to start is who did you kind of have in mind when? you were writing this what was it the sorts of things the stories that Catherine and Lisa just just sort of described was it sort of a book for the people that haven't quite worked out how this role really works and how to be the most effective at it give us a sense of of how this book came into being yeah absolutely well um the, the book is it is for this audience right and actually Lisa and Catherine hearing you talk um this book is our book um this book was about all of us. It, it, it was from the beginning. It always will be. Um, it's our journey. Um, so it's really written for people who are new to the discipline, but also people who are experienced in the discipline and people who might be coming from tangential disciplines, but have some interaction with business architecture. And, you know, 
even leaders that can understand the concepts, you know, at a more basic level, even if they selectively choose, you know, different chapters to read in the book. I did have a decision to make on whether I was going to write the strategy execution major and the business architecture minor first, or the business architecture major, the strategy execution minor, which is what I ended up doing. So um, this one is really through the that business architecture lens, and I wanted to simplify it, make it practical, connect the dots, and humanize it a little bit because I'm just so passionate about bringing us together, helping create common foundation of understanding because the people we are and the things we're trying to do, it's all about the why, not about the what. So I really wanted to keep advancing the conversation so we can do what I think our organizations and societies need us to do most. That's um, a really key point, isn't it? The why rather than the what. I think as I mean, Lisa described the whole business architecture versus sort of enterprise, which started to touch on that. And I think the challenge with architecture is it can, it's easy to fall in the technical details trap of the what rather than the spirit, you know, the, in the intention. What, what, why are we doing this in the first place? And I see that time and time again. And I think, I mean, we've, I know we've touched on this before, but I think the reason that business architecture has carved itself out separately, but obviously linked to enterprise architecture is that unfortunately a lot of enterprise architects struggle to get out of their own way in many respects when it comes to that challenge, right? I mean, Lisa, I'd love to sort of come to you on this one. Is that, is that something that sort of resonates? Yeah, it does. I mean, my background was I did start in IT. So I was business studies, but IT career from day one, I was coding. And I feel the enterprise architecture career comes out of the IT organization. You know, that's where if, if you've never worked in IT, you wouldn't even have heard the word enterprise architect. Um, so and, and I do feel that the technology world, because we are trying to deploy solutions into businesses, it's like the inside out to enterprise architecture and business architecture. It's we've got a solution. We need to put this into the business. I think what Wendy's book clearly lays out is business architecture is outside in. And I don't think the I, the enterprise architects of IT see it that way. I mm. think they see it as inside out. And then people like us come along, we focus more on the business problem, the business capabilities, the business need. It may not involve any IT. It might be an organizational change. And we butt up because we're coming outside in, they're coming inside out. Um, and I think the word enterprise and business often gets confused. Mm. You know, if I'm an enterprise <clears throat> architect, of course I worry about the business. Well, you worry about the business from an IT point of view. As, as business architecture worries about the business model first and the technology second. And the book lays that out. I mean, it lays out, you were talking about your capabilities, you were talking about your organisational model, you were talking about how it works with IT, but that was a small part of it, Wendy. Um, so I can see both sides, but I, I get frustrated by enterprise architects that are so technical yeah. and think they're business architects because they've spent 90% of the time in the technology space, 10% of the time in the business space. As I and think it, business it, architects the other way around. It's, it's hard, right? I mean, there's so many different aspects of the business strategy, sort of execution and sort of line of business terminology. And then there's all the different parts of technology. I think, you know, back in the day, perhaps there was one enterprise architect. And in fact, we touched on this in a recording we did last year um, with Paul Price and with um, Chris Potts, who's another author, actually, who's really interesting to sort of read, um, the, you know, the, the kind of constant debate, unfortunately, we have about what enterprise architecture is and unfortunately I think it really distracts from getting value out of it but I really like yeah I agree I really like the way that Wendy has kind of set, so yeah made clear what what this is what this is about where the sort of boundaries are and I think it takes it takes everyone and uh clearly there are times when you need deep technical expertise to deliver something really innovative cutting edge from a tech perspective but it's pointless if you don't you know engage the business on a change journey and a transformation piece I suppose with that, Catherine, I guess I'll come to you next in terms of that sort of change management and delivery kind of aspect. I know you're, you know, you're, you're now the delivery principal, and I suppose it sounds to me like from when you were talking just now, one of the common sort of factors is kind of delivering significant change. I mean, how do you, how do you sort of see business architecture and sort of transformation and things kind of 
working together this has this book sort of unlocked anything new in that regard for you i think it's crystallized my thinking um in, in many ways um so where i've spent time working as a business analyst rather than an IT architect. I'm a business analyst within an IT world. You do talk to the business folk. So uh, ironically, I was talking to, to dad at lunchtime and, and saying to him, I had one particular situation where we had a, a beautiful IT um, design, functional design laid out. And we had somebody in the finance department who just said, no, we're not doing it. And it got all the way escalated up. And eventually I went and had a chat with her to discover the reason we couldn't do it is because the, the, the finance process didn't hang up. What we were suggesting would have meant we were doing something totally illegal from a, a tax accounting perspective. But the IT solution was beautiful. It was brilliant, real genius. And it's, it's through sort of my exposure as a, a, a business analyst that you see more of the business world and you get an understanding of it that potentially IT architects don't see. So I think there's, coming back onto the point of the change management, I think there's, there's sort of almost, um, there needs to be a voice for the business analyst a bit more. I think it, within the world of IT, the IT architects and the enterprise architects are are seen as the, the thought leaders uh, and the ones with the solution. And the business analysts almost follow. And I think there almost needs to be a rebalance of that where you listen to these people who work with business users and hear a bit more about what they have to say um, and, and react to it. And then the, the link in then for me with the delivery side of things is if you have the thought up front and the strategic thinking up front about potentially where your business needs to go, work with your, your IT or enterprise architects then to work out how you do that, that then leads beautifully into your change management of, OK, let's chunk it up into projects, deliver it, release the value, release the metrics, business benefit realisation. So I think they they all knit together. Um, but ultimately, you need the, the puppet master to put all the pieces in, in, in play in, in the right order and, and execute them at the right time. It's funny you said that because actually before Lisa, uh, Lisa and I kind of um, when we were, we were joining the calls for hit record, we were commenting that often the role is to connect the dots and be that sort of holistic. Um, sort of thinker and when it comes to that sort of holistic thinking um, I see a big challenge which we talk about a lot on Architect tomorrow around sustainability and, and it was beautiful that Wendy you covered this towards the end of the book um, and I think I joked on consultant saying things that perhaps I can twist your arm into writing a, a sequel which, I'll, which I'd love to kind of get involved with but anyway we'll part that for, for now but my, my, my point was going to be um, the kind of yeah the kind of bigger picture thinking rethinking ecosystem supply chains um, you know, business capabilities, all of that stuff needs to be done in, in the spirit of sustainability. We're going to need to break some business, businesses down and rethink how do we source materials? How do we produce this widget? Because it's going to need, you know, a, a complete overhaul. And so I'm really interested, Wendy, in the points you sort of raised around sort of, you know, the sustainability and perhaps the circular economy and things like that. And I don't know if um, any, any others, are, you know, you're welcome to sort of chip in sort of points in this regard, but what, what is your sort of hope when it comes to sort of business architecture and sort of sustainability? Yeah, well, um, I think it gives us, importantly, a design construct and the scaffolding or mechanism to truly embed sustainability ideas throughout an organization. So, for example, I think it can help people reimagine and redesign what circular looks like or what sustainable looks like. You know, how do you bend a value chain and make it circular or thinking about a, you know something like a value network and the people that we work with or value streams extending or bending them um, of course things like business models and embedding sustainable design principles into that and and even capabilities right so i do a full overlay i mean depending on the industry of if this is your capability map, what are the sustainability considerations for every capability? So if it's in product design, it might be about, you know, design for disassembly or design for reuse and packaging. It might be dematerializing or using natural materials or, or creating services, right, instead of goods. But if we can tie those things right into the, the deep the DNA and the structure of our business, we're almost forced to think about it every time we invest in a capability or do something to it. So I just think it's very powerful to help us see the future and then to help us redesign it. As you were talking, it reminded me of um, diversity and inclusion. 
in that it, it can't just be isolated into one particular section of your, your business. You don't just do it at talent acquisition. You, you do it throughout. The whole business is about being inclusive. Um, and it's almost that we need the same culture and mindset rather than it being a tangible business unit that goes and does sustainability. It has to be something that every employee in the company at some point eats, sleep, breathes and believes and, and DNA, it was a brilliant, brilliant choice of term there, it, becoming part of the individual's DNA as well as the company DNA. You, you couldn't have said it better. That is the idea. That is the opportunity. And then the business architecture is the same scaffolding to embed everything, DEI, sustainability, like all these ideas, ethics. I love that. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. it's really interesting because when when you're talking earlier you're saying this book for you is all about the why and business architecture is all about the why I, i'm going to be controversial everything i've read is all about the how and for me the whole way through i was thinking this isn't the why are we doing this the how are we doing it how do we make this thing work how do we make it a reality and again listening to you there for me i, I know that the, the book says that it's focused on the why but my interpretation of it is definitely on the how side of things I mean, I think it is on the how, Catherine. I definitely think, and I can see that as we go through it, because it's, it's how you do it, the things you do in it, the things you're connected to. I just wonder whether the reason to um, analyse the how is through the lens of why. Mm -hmm. You know, so the, the example that Wendy just gave there around sustainability, you know, I'm looking at my capabilities to address what? OK, today's challenge is I'm looking through my capabilities to address the why of sustainability and, and why do we need to do sustainability for all these reasons? Now, let's look at the how. And it just gives you you can do the how without the why. But do the how with the why and it becomes really powerful. And, and I don't think to your point, I don't think the why the why comes out enough in the how that you go through in the book. Um, it's there, it's implied, but it's not explicit. But that sustainability case study is a good one of saying, look, this is all about the why of sustainability through why we need it, what we need to consider in it. And this is how we do our profession, which is business architecture. Mm -hmm. I mean, my worry about the term business architecture, and I was going to say this earlier, Oliver, is I think why we get confused with the IT world is because we use the world architect mm -hmm. and the only the only profession outside of construction that use the words architect is IT. And I think with the intersection group, they try and go down the sort of business designer route. And if I'm sitting at, a, at an event and someone asks me what I do, 10 years ago, I used to say I'm a business architect, but I just got fed up with people looking at me with this face of what the heck does a business architect do that I now say I'm a business designer or a business modeler because that term business designer and business modeler resonates more with non-techie people business architects they suddenly think oh I heard architect I didn't hear business so that there's some of that in the language I think that, that we're going on that journey and it's, it's interesting, I, I see perhaps people moving away from the enterprise architect term and maybe business architect will, yeah, kind of emerge as, as something else for the reason you sort of outline. And I suspect actually that the building profession architects that spend, what, seven years getting a degree in architecture are all quite annoyed that we all sort of self-apply the architect kind of label. And I've talked to Paul Price about this from ISA, who's who's all about sort of, you know, the kind of professionalization of, of, of technology architects. But yeah, I think you, on the one hand, you could argue it's semantics, but I actually think it's important. And a lot of the book and what we're talking about here is about more the emotional side and the change management and getting people, you know, we touched on portfolio and program management. And that for me is when I had that epiphany that actually I can sit here and I can create as many clever diagrams or, or models as I like. But until I go and speak to the program manager or the portfolio manager who actually is in charge of what gets delivered and what actually gets realized, all this is pointless. So one of my biggest um, sort of allies when I was working as, a, as an enterprise architect, hopefully in the more holistic sense than just IT, was very much to get them, them involved. And I think it's, yeah, what we call it is, I don't know, it's probably more important that what, what the outcomes that get delivered from it. But unfortunately, for the reasons we talked about earlier, because of the, often because of the technical kind of beginnings or the technical roots that a lot of the architects have, they kind of don't 
they don't get to that point because they're still stuck. And I, and I have this thing with particularly with technologists is I think they often get stuck in the job before or a couple of jobs before mindset. And that's what stops them really performing. And I think this book for me, one of the things I think I've said to Wendy before is this book for me is, would be a, is amazing for anyone who is a little bit stuck in that sort of technical enterprise architect role and wants to kind of understand how do I become more strategic? How do I become more effective? How do I make things happen in my organization? I think the intersection stuff you've touched on as well, Lisa, I mean, clearly last time you appeared, we talked to the intersection team and that's a very slim book, but it's also very uh, impactful and insightful in terms of how you make change. But um, I want to slightly switch gears now, Wendy, and I want to talk to you about women in architecture, because this is something I know you've been really passionate about. You've been really active kind of getting this off the ground. And so can you talk to us a little bit about women in architecture and your role in it? Yeah, you bet. Um, and most importantly, I, I do like to say that we are we are women in architecture, because I feel like we are entirely co-creating a movement, what it's going to entail, what it's going to achieve together. Um, there's a lot of support and excitement globally. Um, so we are, or Women in Architecture is, as we say, it's a global initiative to really create the pathway for women in architecture. So for those women who are working in, in architecture now, we want to amplify impact, we want them to succeed, and we want to create the path, as I said. So, so there are more women in this discipline. There's you know, less than 15%, um, according to most of our statistics, are is, is the number of women that are, are playing an enterprise architect role. So we definitely have some work to do. And um, yeah, so it's, it's just an initiative we're, we're really passionate about, particularly at a time when, you know, our charge as architects is so big and important. We need all of us and we need to be at our best. So, um, yeah. So anyway, I am lucky enough to, to serve as the leadership chair of this um, as part of a, a broader leadership committee. But like I said, there's there's a WIA um, community that anyone can join. It's free. And um, we're shaping the program right now, you know, coaching circles and mentoring and outreach and conversations and content so that's really the aim awesome and if people want to get involved in that what's the best way for them to do that yeah the women in architecture.org is the website and then from there or we're going to have a linkedin page really soon you can find the link to our community so our community which is the free one um is on mighty networks but you just need the link for that we could also include the link in the show notes as well awesome brilliant thank you and so kind of moving towards sort of wrapping things up i'd like to kind of perhaps ask lisa and, and then Catherine what what other sort of reflections, thoughts um, from the book that you perhaps like to discuss with Wendy? And we can make this pretty free form, right? I mean, feel free to kind of ju ju jump in uh, bet between us all and, 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 and talk to Wendy about, about the book in sort of closing. I mean, I love the book. I'm, I'm a fan. I think, Wendy, when you opened up, you said this book are for people like us who do the role. Um, I, I want the book to become read by others that don't understand our role mm -hmm. and I think you know if, if somebody was to to read just maybe five to ten pages of it just to scan through and just say ah oh, yeah I see Lisa do that I see Catherine do that I see Wendy do that I think it's how do we excite others to read it that aren't in the profession to realize what the profession unlocks for them and how do we get that voice out there to the COOs, not just to the CIOs, to CEOs that have never heard of it rather than CEOs that have heard of it and are just endorsing it. Um, and I think your book has got so much um, value in it that it's easy for people who've never heard about it to to buy into it. So it's just how how do we get out how do we get it out there to those that have never heard about architecture? Because the sooner we do, the better. I love that more than I can say. That's our charge. Let's do that. I mean, I did, I wrote the first chapter so that people could just read that. But even as you're saying this, Lisa, people don't even need that much. This sounds like something to work together on. How do we, how do we package? What are the right pieces? How do we get it out there? I wrote this book for that and for these conversations. So I say, let's just move into action. I will say one of my, um, as a side note, one of my most exciting moments around this book has been when architects and their leaders have gotten together other leaders and business leaders 
So they're getting together cross sections. They'll bring in like the head of strategy, HR, risk, product. And to have, I, chill, I have chills when I say it, like to have these business leaders, it feels like the discipline is coming home where they're talking about a common language. They're talking about what's best for the enterprise. They're asking, how do we move into action? Who do we need to talk about? Where do we start? So anyway, I think that if we can arm people to have more of those conversations and we get those sound bites out there, let's do this. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Just jumping in there, um, a similar sort of train of thought, but but slightly different. Um, as I was reading this book, my sort of the key thing that's coming to my the front of my mind is every startup founder needs this book, um, and small business founder needs this book because you you often have people with some amazing ideas um, who have done whatever career theirs theirs is, but when it comes to actually setting up a company, do it right first time. And I think if you have this book as your bible that you follow it would make your life so much easier um the the question though that i have is when you have um a company with sort of an established c-suite who hasn't heard of this term business architecture the sell is quite a difficult one because you're ultimately asking for some very senior people with lots of experience which often equates to very expensive coming in and focusing on the business to improve the business and as a business architect you understand the value but how do you explain that upfront cost to the c-suite to say this is money well spent and that for me i think would be the biggest challenge that we'd need to think about how do you overcome that to make it go go viral almost and, and lisa oliver i would love your thoughts on this too i mean i think you really nail an important point there too and also on startups by the way because startups wouldn't end up in the same challenges as our big organizations have today if they sort of did it right from the beginning but but the c-suite conversations can be tricky because um i find anyway you have to have the right value pitch and the right why right to bring in these ideas it's not like hey we need to do business architecture it's like we need to do we need here's a here's a problem we need to solve and here's how that's going to be part of the solution so um it's it's pitching it the right way i think um and then i think also over time as these ideas flow into academics and executive and business literature it's going to be easier than it is today um also you know it just a CIO, a CEO I work with, she used to be a business architect um, very early in her career. Nobody has to sell her on business architecture. So I'm just very hopeful as these, you know, sort of ripples play out over time that Lisa Oliver thoughts on, on selling. To yeah. Sales? I mean, I, I, I think the, the analogy I like to use is every organization is like a garden, right? I mean, you, you have things growing in your garden regardless of if you have a gardener or not. But obviously, the garden tends to be even more productive for growing things or look more aesthetically pleasing if you have a gardener kind of looking after it and tending it. And so many organizations have have an architecture, but it's kind of just grown and emerged over time. And sometimes that works, but it can often lock organizations into a certain path forward. And it's those times when you need to sort of pivot. And like Catherine said, the startups is a great one. Unfortunately, I think most startups don't realize they needed to think about how all the component parts are going to knit together until it's too late and they kind of go oh yeah we should have thought about that a bit earlier um but yeah so for me it's kind of this the selling selling the uh the leadership on the fact that yeah we can we can be conscious about this or not but then don't be surprised if you don't have the levers to pull when you want to change course and and i think and i think it's um i think it i think i think going in with you need business architecture to solve these problems is one way i i think there's 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 sort of a more hearts and minds approach that we need to get to, which is, but where's your Wendy in your organization? Where's your Lisa? Where's your Catherine? Not as, because they are already doing business architecture, but they are the, who is joining up dots for you? Who is, who is sort of curious? Who is out there working with HR, marketing and IT just because they do? And that could be business analysts, as you say, Catherine. Um, or it could be a finance partner or an HR partner that just is curious about find those people and get them involved in your work. And then behind the scenes, give those skills and competencies and capabilities of business architecture to those people. Because, you know, when we opened up this conversation, it was 
how did you get involved in business architecture? And I think all of us fell into it. It wasn't a job that was there that we could apply for. We we fell into it. It's not been a profession that's been around for a long time. It's a path for the curious, isn't it? It's, it's the curious sort of connecting curious. mind that can exactly. open up that door. Exactly. And I think, you know, we've all gone on to get involved, get curious and deliver in the programmes and projects and initiatives that we have. Not because we applied for a job as a business architect, but because we were on those roles doing what has become business architecture so I think it's find those curious people or who is the curious person on your project and let's enable them more to accelerate their delivery with these skills and capabilities of the book so it's probably a bit more chicken and egg or you know what came first the dog or the tail or whatever it is I don't know the phrase but it's 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 enabling those that already are doing it with these skills, competencies, capabilities, models and references, rather than going in and trying to say, hey, take us because we can do it. And I think that comes back to your coaching, Wendy, you know, your, you know, whether it's up and coming males or females in this space, it, it, it's, it's finding them, seeking them out, coaching them and showcasing what they do. And I think then you get that movement. Exactly. And you just highlight that. I think worldwide, architects are a special people. We think a certain way. And I have to say, I feel like we have, it. curious is a great word. I think arguably there's a little altruistic. We want to do what is best for the organization or the society. Yeah. And, and on that note, I actually, I, mean, I was going to... One, one other thing, Oliver, I think, you know, I, I've been very inspired by LinkedIn um, because I'm in a minority in my organisation and LinkedIn opens up that global community of other minorities. And, and I think business architecture is a minority group. Mm -hmm. And it's not until you branch out and talk to others like us and you immediately, immediately, Catherine, when you were telling your story, Wendy, when you were telling yours, I was thinking... Why weren't you anywhere near me 20 years ago? It's because I was in a minority. And I think how we get that network of minorities realising there is a community out there that think like us, that look at models like us, that can drive together. But it, it takes externally networking. You're not going to get it from your internal organisation, which I think makes it challenging. And that's part of what Architect Tomorrow is about, right? It's connecting up people, sharing stories and, and, and that sort of things. But where I wanted to sort of take us as the final sort of point was um, what I like to talk about, uh, as many people know on Architect Tomorrow, is where is this going? And so clearly we've touched on sustainability. We've talked about kind of sharing the message of business architecture more widely. But uh, Wendy, Lisa and Catherine, I'd like your take on where do you hope and think this is going to go in the next sort of three to five years? Well, I'll start and then, then when you all can end. Um, certainly increasingly framework for things like sustainability and bringing us together around achieving collectively the um, sustainable development goals. Yes, definitely. Um, I really hope this ultimately goes to becomes a strategic business discipline. We're, we're seeing it going that way. I talked about the conversations. We see universities putting this now in exec ed. And, uh, you know, as part of MBA programs, um, that's going to challenge us in a different way, because there's a little tug on the rigor that we're going to have to figure out, you know, kind of who does what. But I think ultimately, you know, having this catch on in the in business leadership and having architecture be for everybody, that is where I hope it goes. I hope it goes. Lisa? Yeah, I'm with Wendy all the way. I think um, I think driving the competency and capability in many roles, not just in the experts is the way to go. Um, and I think I think as the world of business models become more complex, you know, with platforms, with partners, with collaborations to deliver value for things, it, it becomes ultimately more important. It's the bigger wicked aspects of operating model um, that, that's challenging, which I think this can address. Um, so, yeah, and I just hope we don't have to keep fighting for the value we bring and people actually recognise the value for what we do. I mean, that, that will resonate very much with Catherine because Catherine and I have had quite a few conversations recently about kind of championing and making the case for, for that. But um, 
we perhaps will steer a little bit away from that one, Catherine. But um, uh, so, Catherine, what, what, what's your sort of hopes um, for, for this space? I'd love to see it becoming a default role for roles. Um, so, so if I said to you, right, we're going to set up a business, you'd think you need a money person. So, I don't know, CFO or whatever. You're going to need somebody who's focusing on operations. So you need a COO. I, I would love that the default thought process is we're going to have one of these, one of these, one of these, and a business architect and one of the, and it's just a foregone conclusion. I think if every business had a business architect as a foregone conclusion, every business would be significantly better. And I think they'd see it on their profit margins. Every program, Catherine, every, program, yes, every yes. program, every business. I've looked at a program plan today and there's no business architect. And I'm thinking, this is a major transformation. Where is that role? Yeah. People just don't think of it. It's like the gardener again. It's it, Hopefully someone will tend to the rose bush over there and someone else will think about the capability model over there. But it, it, it probably not in the way that a business architect uh, would if, it, you know, if given the sort of resources to do so. Um, Ladies, that this has been fantastic as I suspected it would be. I think this is hopefully going to be a really useful resource for many people in the profession or thinking about entering the profession. Um, do go and check out the things we've talked about. Do go and check out Wea. Uh, do go and check out some of Lisa's writing. That's great. Um, and yeah, you can find us all on LinkedIn if you want to kind of reach out and connect to us. Um, and with that, I just want to say thanks very much, everybody. Um, and if you've enjoyed this, do go and check out the other episodes where the ladies have, 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 have been on. Um, and we've covered sort of many other topics. Oh, and yet yeah, the book, of course, do go and check out uh, the book because that's the main topic of this podcast episode. Whoops. Uh, so yes, we'll obviously put notes on where to find the book as well, which is, uh, which is great. Uh, and it's you know, brought us all together and got us talking. So with that, thanks again uh, and look forward to speaking to you all very soon. Thank you.